Um, I'm back in my office. Um, I was thinking for this week, one of the difficult things in advocacy is the issue of people, um, people in your school using an approach to teach that is very, um, um, very unhelpful to ESL kids, English language learners. Um, and this can come in a lot of different ways. It can come from many different directions. Uh, you may not be very close to, uh, you may know of a situation and you may not be able to intervene. Um, sometimes you need to, you need to work toward creating a school understanding about what are the best ways for ESL kids to be, uh, their needs to be met in each class. For instance, um, there was an example. I, one example was very subtle one is in my other class actually. Someone uh, mentioned that uh, he observed that the students from uh, Central America were getting in trouble for behavior. And he realized the problem was that they weren't making eye contact, which in their culture is how you communicate. Young children do not make eye contact with adults, teachers, etc. That's disrespectful. And so every time they averted their eyes, they were uh, written up for being disrespectful. So that's a nonverbal um, communication issue. Um, you know, I mentioned that in some other classes on cultural aspects. I'm not doing it in here. I may, I may run that out for you. Just some of you may want to look at that, but I don't want to just keep dumping stuff on you. Um, there's a lot I want to share with you, but I can't do it all. Um, so you have the example of a perceived misbehavior that wasn't disrespectful, but it was a cultural um, um, conflict there, communication, difference in communication. Um, what are some other ones? Well, expecting the kids, the EL kids, to perform uh, using material that's inappropriate for them. Um, another one is people trying to run the kids out of their class because they don't feel that uh, either they, well, generally they're not very friendly toward English lang language learners, or they may feel they don't know how to teach them and they're angry that they're in their class. That's very common. Um, Testing is another one. Uh, sometimes I've seen situations where uh, teachers actually give them some meaningless exercises because they feel that uh, I don't know what to do with them, so I'll just give them a word search or crossword puzzle or some kind of meaningless exercise. And as a result of that, uh, they're not challenged in their class. So you've got the issue of not being challenged uh, being punished for disrespect. Um, and so most of you in uh, your classes, if you've dealt with ESL or other cultures, you've seen some of this. Um, one that I noticed once was bullying, which is very common, in which some of the kids went up to a kid from Southeast Asia and would uh, say things to him quietly to try to give a reaction. And then one day he reacted, he threw his tray in the lunchroom and he pushed the other kid. And as a result, the principal threw him out of school because he didn't really want him in there in the first place. Now that he did something, he could throw the book at him. So that student never finished his education uh, because there wasn't anybody to advocate for him. And that happens a lot. It can happen if you have administration that's, or teachers that are setting them up or are indifferent to their situation. Um, I was, when I was thinking about this week's discussion, I was more concerned about educational problems, either like I mentioned, you know, the wrong materials or the wrong attitude. Um, so the big, the big thing there, I think, is you, you, you need to get the school uh, to have some kind of central authority and support and 
as an advocate for the students and also a person, a couple of people that are respected that can, that can support the English learners academically as well as culturally advocate for them. Um, some of the uh, issue, you know, and I put this out this week, I showed you the history of English language teaching and I have you those documents and you can go through some of those. You don't have to go through all of those for this particular class. That's more for the other class, uh, the uh, TESOL class, because they're kind of get a quick version of the overview of everything. But um, I believe very much you want to, that last page that has the three versions, you want communicative, you want the natural approach, you want listening, speaking, reading and writing combined in the lessons. And I'm talking about this should be something that the language arts teachers in particular should be aware of. But I have students in, the, in my classes this summer some of you are like science teacher, I think up at, uh, uh, Katie up at, uh, I think it's Katie up at O'Neill. Science teacher, you have to have science materials, you know, you have to have identification, uh, vocabulary is to be taught, etc. And that's the same deal in a content class for the regular teachers. I don't like the term regular or normal, like you're abnormal if you're teaching something different. Um, so I just use classroom teachers, but being an advocate in that sense is something to be aware of. I'm, you know, I'm kind of wandering around this little talk here, but those are some of the issues that are on my mind. And so I invite you um, to, on your discussion this week and also, which I've already put up, and also in, in some more free for all, situations. I love scenarios and I would love for each of you, in fact I haven't thought of this, but it's not an assignment but it's an idea for a discussion which we could do, um, is, is to give some situations and then either you didn't have a solution, you couldn't solve it, or maybe you did solve it, but just throw that out there and I'll, I'll put these up and now I have people just talk about it because I'm really enjoying, especially my new class as well as your class, uh, is that a lot of back and forth and talking and chatting. A new class has 10 people, so it's really simple to have everybody interact with everybody else. But we could do that with 20. Um, I just like to put more emphasis on the discussion and interaction rather than writing papers. Um, I do have an interview for you to do this week. Well, wait a minute. Is that the other class? I have to be careful. I'm thinking two classes, so forget about that. Um, but um, I think that pretty much covers what I was going to cover. So, but, but this week is about advocacy and it's more of internally in the classrooms and in school. So uh, anything's game. I mean, I'm not ruling out stuff. I'm just thinking a little more of academic. Oh, one other thing was testing. And that you don't always have a lot of control over. Some people have their own tests in the school. But um, one of the most frustrating things I've had mentioned to me, which is obvious, I've always had this mentioned, is you have English language learners and suddenly they enter a school and after about a month, they're given standardized tests in a language where they have no idea what the answers are. And it's very upsetting. And I think it's humiliating. And it may be required by law, but then nobody ever said the law is merciful, right? Um, but that's something you need to advocate against because you're not going to get a legitimate score. Just like if I took a IQ test in Turkish, I would never do very well. You know, even if it was just an oral test, I probably wouldn't do very well. Um, so I would just argue that um, you're going to, I'm looking at things from many different directions here. And so teaching strategies, testing, uh, books that are available. Um, you know, uh, those of you that have been in my other class, you know, I do a review of bilingual or multicultural literature. I happen to have a lot of books here on the shelf. I'm not going to drag them out and turn this into a one hour video. But um, video books that are in two languages are very useful. And that might be something you could persuade the um, other teachers to give credit for and, and uh, 
I don't know if you could do it, an accelerator reader, but I have a very low opinion of accelerator reader. So I'll just tell you that right from the start so we don't have any doubts about it. Um, I just uh, find it, um, it's great for people that read and for people that don't like to read, it's not very helpful, it doesn't motivate, it doesn't teach reading. You have to meet this reader where they are. And, and ultimately, just like writing or other exercises or whatever activities, if they're not pleasurable activities, why do them? If I have people write in Spanish in a Spanish class, why not have them write letters? Don't have them write reports on things they don't really care about, like the resource production of Columbia. How much cotton, how much other stuff do they produce and coal and mining and emeralds? They don't care about that. And so having people do something like that, it's like when I would go to gym and we'd always do those squat thrusts. Hopefully that has died, but it's one of the dumbest exercises I've ever seen. You do those and they're kind of like a combination go up. It's like you go up like a, a jump up. It's not a, it's not a jumping jacks. So and then you go down in the squat and then you have to do a push up. And I guess that's supposed to get you in shape. I, I do stairs and I'm pretty darn good shape. And so I find that I like stairs and I, it's just like reading. If you like reading mystery novels, get the kid every and read every mystery novel you ever get your hands on. Reading is reading. And um, if it's not exciting and they don't want to do it on their own, then it's not going to happen. Um, all right, dribbled on long enough. I will let you take this for what it's worth and think about it when you do your discussion. I invite any emails if I should excite you about some ideas. Thank you.